Welcome back to Something Ominous. This is your host, Jessica. And I'm Karina. It's our Valentine's episode. I know Valentine's technically was yesterday, but it's our Valentine's week. So we have some um, love themed stories. Not really. Yeah. Kind of tragic. <laughs> kind of love. Kind of tragic. Um, but yeah, I'm excited. You know, I feel like Valentine's this year is really about self-love. It is. I think I've always looked forward to Valentine just because of it was always like a big event at school. So I don't know. I love that. Dude, my favorite Valentine's memory is like being in elementary and exchanging the cards. Mm -hmm. Like, you know how we would all be waiting with our little buckets. The teachers would be like, OK, go. And then we would all just stand yes. up and start just like passing out cards. Like that was my favorite part about Valentine's. That was fun. I'm going to start today. And then we have a little Reddit story at the end. So I'm excited for that one, too. Me, too, because you made it seem like I got a story. And I'm I like, what is it? <laughs> like, like I found something. <laughs> Today's story is kind of a tragic love story, and it's also close to home. I will be telling the story of the ghost bride that haunts Hotel Galvez in Galveston, Texas. I want to go there and stay the night at least <laughs> one night. I was going to say, I'm like, this one is actually one that we can go visit. Good. Let's plan it. Mm -hmm. okay <laughs> <laughs> um, and honestly i don't really know galveston too well every time i've gone it's just to go to the beach or to go to pleasure pier or kima so i haven't really heard of hotel galvez but if you've been to galveston and look up pictures i'm pretty sure you've seen it before it's a resort hotel that was built in 1911 and it stands out because it's painted a pretty peach or like a light pink color a lot of famous guests have stayed here, and it even served as a temporary White House to Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1937. The hotel has about 220 rooms, and even though it's known for its luxury, it is also known to be haunted. This particular story is about the ghost bride, Audra. This story takes place in the 1950s. Audra was 25 years old and was at the peak of her love life. She was engaged to a mariner, and his ship would usually depart from Port Galveston, so Audra would often travel with him. She had her favorite room, which was room 501. The room was really close to the elevators, and from there, it had an access ladder to the roof where she would impatiently wait for her fiancé. One day, after one of the worst thunderstorms, Audra finds out that the ship that her fiancé was in had overturned and all lives were lost. Audra was devastated. She had lost the love of her life in that ship and felt like all her hopes and dreams were lost as well. In despair, Audra hung herself in the west turret of the hotel in the 8th floor. To make matters even worse, her fiancé returned a couple days later. He had actually survived and had eagerly returned to look for her. It's said that now, not just room 501, but the whole fifth floor has the most haunted activity. The Houston Chronicle reported that one guest stayed in room 501 with intent to make contact with Audra. Apparently, he spent all day trying to reach her without success, but at 3 a.m., she finally appeared. It said he had a photograph of a hand reaching out to him that looked like a lady's hand. The guest ran downstairs after he saw her apparition and was trying to check out as quickly as possible. It said the receptionist offered another room, but he refused. <laughs> and it seems like this is a most requested room. Like everyone that stays there wants to book room 501 yeah. to do investigations. I find it so funny because you go there for that and then you run out scared. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I'm like, <laughs> why would you go to a haunted place wanting to make contact? And then when you do yeah. and you're successful, you're like running out. I feel like those people probably haven't had like paranormal experiences, maybe. Yeah. And they're like, holy shit. And like, this is yeah. on another level. That'll be us. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's how it is. <laughs> Dude, I don't think I would even sleep. I think i would just because i feel like i'm used to it but i haven't seen an apparition but i mean you know the things that have happened at my house yeah. the door being opened on me all that stuff and it, like i don't think i would be scared but maybe if i see her i would be like shit yeah. like if you wake up and she's just standing yeah i would still bed. stay there but not in the room. I would probably be like, hey, can I change rooms real quick, please? Yeah, no. Um, no and not go back for my stuff until the next day in the morning. There has to be daylight. <laughs> um, if I'm with someone else, I know for sure I wouldn't be scared. I have to be with like another two people. So I can sleep in the middle and be like sandwiched. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's always been a thing of yeah, yours. I know. <laughs> like I've always had to sleep with like you and Lily and I sleep in the middle. Yeah. There's a Reddit story of another guest that stayed in this hotel. This is user Schwab Schwab, and it goes like this. 
Back in December, I stayed at the Hotel Galvez off the seawall. The hotel is lovely, but is notorious for being haunted. Something I didn't realize till we stayed there. If you Google, you'll see the backstory and I'd recommend doing so. They say the fifth floor is haunted and the ghost of a young woman appears in rooms and wanders the hallway. They also say the ghosts of small children like to play tricks. People have said they've heard children laughing in the hallway around 4 a.m. and saw no sight of them. When I stayed there, we were on the third floor. I learned when we got there that hauntings happened around 4 a.m. on the fifth floor. So we should be in the clear, or so I thought. A room was situated near the elevators, which weren't a big deal because there weren't many people there because it was off season. Well, at 4 a.m., I was woken up by the sound of the elevator opening and closing. I didn't think much of it until I heard it again and again. I laid in bed listening to the elevator open and shut, dinging and banging when closing. This went on for a good 10 minutes of me just listening. I finally got the courage to get up and look out the peephole. I saw the elevator opening and closing by itself, but no one was there. I then got the courage to leave my room and investigate. I walked out and saw no one there but the button being firmly held down on the outside. The elevator then closed and went up to the fifth floor and then came back. The whole process kept going on for hours till maintenance arrived. They looked at everything and saw nothing wrong. They also said the elevator button was new so it wouldn't have gotten stuck. So the only thing that makes sense to me was that some ghost decided to ruin our getaway. I ended up filming the ordeal and it is creepy for sure. But Hotel Galvez is a lovely hotel and I would still recommend staying even with the ghost there. The end. Does he have videos? Yeah, there's a video here. You imagine just laying there Hearing the elevator door opening and closing. Ding. Yeah. Ding. Oh, so he recorded the elevator door opening and closing. Yeah. Stop. You know, because we see that. Like if someone's walking in and walking out, you know how the door will stop and then opens up again and closes and opens up again. Yeah. Like when you're trying to catch an elevator, you put your hand through and it opens. That's how it is. It's not completely closing or opening. It's just like halfway closing and then it opens. Yeah. Oh, but look here, it actually closed. Did he push the button or the button was pushed? The button was pushed. Oh, okay. The button was pushed. Mm. Oh my God. That is so interesting. Mm. Karina, let's go. Just one night. We can plan a trip. You, myself, I don't know if Lily would want to go. And then we could probably (laughs) gather two other cousins. We could, only if I can sleep in the middle. That's the only way that I will go. <laughs> There's also a YouTube video that I'll link in the show notes from the account Orb City. The video took place in October of year 2013 in room 505. It's a two minute video. This group does ghost hunting with a thermal camera imaging filter. And in the video, you do see orbs flying around. But to be honest, I'm a little skeptic when it comes to orbs. I don't know how you feel, but I just feel like, I don't know, it can be mistaken for so many other things. Like dust particles or mosquitoes. Yeah. I feel like with an orb, you can see through, whereas a dust particle is just like a solid. It's a solid thing and a bug too. Orbs, they're round spheres. You can actually see through them. Those I believe. But if I can't see through it, I'm like, no, I think that was just dust or a little fly or something. Mm. Yeah. See, I feel like maybe someone that understands them a little bit more would be like, oh my gosh, like that's completely an orb. But to me, I just saw like, like you said, kind of particles flying around. So Mm -hmm. I wasn't sure, but. That's what they that's what they posted. But I will link it in the show notes for you guys to look and see and let us know what you think. But yeah, that is a tragic love story of Audra. Poor Audra. I know. I really hope she finds peace. And I hope she reunites with her fiance in the afterlife. Did they say anything about him? Like what happened to him? Did he No, I couldn't really find I couldn't even find like his name or anything. Uh-huh. I just wonder what happened with him. I wondered if he, I mean, he probably didn't commit suicide because if he would have, then that would have been like the repeating story Mm -hmm. to what happened to her. That's so sad. Poor guy. Poor her. I know. It kind of gave me like Romeo and Juliet kind of story. So I'm next. Yeah. That's it. Was that your Reddit story? Uh, No, I have another like Valentine's Reddit story. So yours was a couple's love story. Mine is a little different. So I wanted to cover the St. Valentine's Day massacre that occurred in Chicago in 1929 and the hauntings that followed. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went (laughs) deep into the murder. I'm like, no love here. I was like, this is going to be fun. Karina's going to be like, but we were supposed to do love. It's going to be love. It's still Valentine's theme. 
So this all took place in Chicago during the 1920s. In the 20s, we were dealing with prohibition, the illegal sales and transportation of alcohol. Speakeasies were being opened left and right because, you know, folks got a drink. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need a little wine now. <laughs> because of prohibition, the community was dealing with beer and alcohol wars between rival gangs and organized crime. The mafia was making millions from illegal sales and transportation of alcohol. Not only the mafia, but anyone that owned a speakeasy was making lots of money. The more money, the more control. You had rival gangs trying to take control of other territories, and they were playing really dirty. So people saw the spike on murders around this time, and it was getting really bad. So according to History.com, in 1924, there were 16 gang-related murders within that year. And by 1929, there were 64 gang-related murders in total within that year. I'm guessing that's a lot. To me, it seems like a little bit, but mm. I, mean, I don't know. It's, nine, it's in the 20s. I guess for that time. Yeah, for that time, it may be a lot. So yeah, it definitely picked up from 1924 to 1929, went from 16 to 64. The events leading up to the massacre started in 1924 when a brewery acquisition deal went wrong between Dion O'Banion the gang leader of Chicago's North Side, and Johnny Torrio, gang leader of Chicago's South Side. Torrio later ordered a hit on O'Banion. Two gunmen entered O'Banion's North Side flower shop, which was a decoy for his mob activities, and was shot to death. The North Side gang, now under control of Jaime Wise, retaliates and later attempts to assassinate Johnny Torrio, but aren't successful. He's seriously injured and retires due to his injuries, leaving Al Capone in charge. Mm. Yeah, so Al Capone now, being the leader of the South Side gang, is like... The North is not getting away with this. And he orders a hit on Jaime Wise murdering him. So after losing two leaders, the North Side bootlegging operation is left in the hands of Irish gangster George Bugs Moran, one of Al Capone's top enemies. Over the years, Al Capone was able to take control of most of Chicago's territory except for the North. January 8th, 1929, Pasqualino Lolordo, one of Al Capone's associates, was shot and killed by unidentified gunmen who broke into his home. They believe the hit was arranged by bugs to help remove protection around Al Capone so they can finally end Al Capone's life. Al Capone was pissed, of course, right? More than that, he wanted to end bugs once and for all. In the morning of Thursday, February 14th, 1929, a bootlegging operation was taking place in a garage at 2122 North Clark Street in Chicago's north side. This garage belonged to bugs and was used as a decoy for his operations. He received a call about a special shipment of bootleg whiskey from Canada that would be arriving at his garage. Bugs sent some of his associates to receive the shipment when several men dressed as policemen walked into the garage. Witnesses say they saw two of them in civilian clothing and other two posing as police officers. They arrived in police cars and even acted as if they were conducting a raid. Based on the evidence of the crime, they lined up six of the members from the Northside gang facing the wall of the garage. A seventh victim, not affiliated with the gang, was also lined against the wall. He was actually an optometrist, but just loved hanging out with the gangsters. Oh, did I know? I was like, dude, you let like your life, yeah, your life for hanging out with these gangsters. Like you could have had a successful life. Mm -hmm. So officers say around 70 rounds of ammunition were fired at mm -hmm. the seven men. When police officers arrived, one of the members was barely hanging on to life. In the minutes before his passing, officers pressed him for information, but he would not talk. He was like, I'm fucking taking this to the grave. Wow. I know. It's crazy. I think I would talk if I was dying. I no think lie. I would, too. If you know yeah. you're, like, about to die, I would just talk. Like, what the fuck's going to happen? I'm yeah. dead. Unless, well, you know, unless, like, he fears for his family or... Oh, yeah, you're right. Mm -hmm. I forgot about that. When police found the few eyewitnesses, they concluded that the gunmen dressed as police officers entered the garage and pretended to be arresting the two men that were dressed in civilian clothing, even sitting them in the back of the car, as a ploy. Wow. So they were trying to blend in 70 yeah. rounds of ammunition. Mm -hmm. People are going to wonder what the heck is going on. So as people were out, they see two policemen with a car and then the two suspects mm -hmm. in the back of the car arrested. Oh. Yeah. So they did that on purpose to get away. That was right. their getaway. It's crazy. Pretty smart. <laughs> Pretty smart. Yeah. I was thinking that I was like, dang, I wouldn't, I wouldn't yeah. think of like that. Like you even thought about the aftermath. Yeah. Like, how am I going to get away with it? How did they get a car? 
I mean, I'm sure there was police officers involved. Yeah. Yeah. No one was ever arrested, but Bugs and others blamed Al Capone, saying that this was Al Capone's method of murder. Al Capone was in Florida at the time, and Bugs escaped death by not being there that day. Apparently, he was running late, so he was supposed to be there. Mm -hmm. The garage where the massacre happened was demolished in 1967. That area is now a side yard for the Margaret Day Blake Apartments, a Chicago housing authority for seniors. Aw. I know. That's, <laughs> that's really sad. I know. I actually couldn't find any hauntings. Mm -hmm. If any hauntings happened in yeah. the senior living facility, mm -hmm. when the garage was demolished, people wanted to keep some of the bricks from the building as collector's items. If they had blood or bullet holes, even better. I know. Well, like, why would you want to keep so it? so weird. That is freaking weird. So stories started coming out that people were experiencing weird things after they got the bricks. Like, no shit. Oh, my God. What did you expect? Like, why would you even want something like that? I guess because, like, big in history. Yeah. It was connected to Al Capone. But it's crazy because it's a brick and, like, the energy that it carries. Exactly. Mm. People started to think that the bricks were cursed because there were reports of some being haunted and getting into car accidents or even getting horrific diseases. The bricks are now located in the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, where they were reassembled to create the wall where the men stood. And if you go to the Las Vegas Mob Museum, mm -hmm. they have the actual wall in the order where the bricks, I guess, oh, like how the wall yeah. was. I mean, I don't know how they did the reconstruction. It says that they were numbered mm -hmm. whenever they demolished them. They were numbered and they put them in that order and you can see all the bullet holes and mm. the, the blood stains. So I am going to link the museum's website. Mm -hmm. They have pictures of the wall in mm -hmm. the museum. And this is Vegas, you said, right? Vegas. Where that it's not in Chicago, like in a museum in Chicago. I know. I don't know. That's weird. When people were reporting the hauntings, they were trying to get rid of the bricks. Oh, okay. Yeah. So they did go to a businessman in Canada, but mm -hmm. I didn't include this on here because there was no haunting under his supervision. Mm -hmm. And um, he just treated them really bad. So I was like, I don't want to include that on here. Oh, okay. But I guess I might as well just say it. So he pretty much opened up a bar and he made a brick wall in the men's restroom mm -hmm. and put the bricks in the order that they were supposed to go. So that's how they were numbered. Because mm -hmm. when he got them from people, he started putting them in an order and he allowed men to pretty much pee on the wall. Yeah, I don't know. But his bar failed. Mm -hmm. So maybe that was a curse. Oh, yeah. Maybe he allowed all of this negative mm -hmm. stuff happen to the wall. And yeah, his bar closed down. But there was no reported hauntings. It's just like his bar wasn't successful at all. Mm -hmm. From there, they auctioned the bricks where the mob museum in oh. Las Vegas okay. bought them. And now it's there. Oh, okay, gotcha. The museum now reports hearing sounds of gunshots and men moaning and falling to the ground. Dang. It's crazy. The prison where Al Capone was, I mean, I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's like super haunted, like especially Al Capone's cell. Mm -hmm. And there's many EMF recordings of him speaking. Yeah. So on Clark Street, where the massacre happened, Similar noises are heard from people that now live in the area. And I didn't mention it earlier, but there was a dog in the garage when the massacre happened. His name was Highball. He belonged to one of the men that was assassinated. He wasn't murdered, but was found tied up and terrified when the officers arrived. They said he was so scared he couldn't stop shaking. He was heard by neighbors crying and barking, and he's actually the reason why the men were found. A woman living in the area went to investigate where the dog cries and barks were coming from and why no one was consoling the dog. And when she walked in, that's when she found the man. But now there are reports of dogs that walk past the area that tend to react and they believe that it picks up the dog's energy that was left behind. Highball was sadly put down because he was so traumatized. No. Yeah. And so they say that when dogs pass by... um. They react negatively to that specific area. Mm. They either start crying or bark or like get scared and run the opposite way. Oh, that's no. so sad. I know. I was so sad. It was a beautiful German Shepherd. And there's a picture of him on the museum's website. Mm -hmm. And he looks terrified. Mm. He's like crouched and his ears are down. His tail's tucked mm -hmm. in. And I'm like, pobrecito. That's really sad. Then there's a building next to where the garage was located that's still standing. The owner told Tony Sabelski of Chicago Haunting Ghost Tours that a lot of poltergeist activity takes place inside. 
He said things fly off the counter and off the shelves. People also report seeing unusual mist and lights as well as hearing men's voices when there's no one in sight. Others have reported feeling fear or a sense of panic, I guess similar to what the dogs pick up, I'm assuming. Yeah. They didn't say, they just say like that's what they feel and they just rather like walk away. And I'm like, it kind of sounds like the reaction the dogs are getting. And to end it, Al Capone was also tormented by the ghost of James Clark, one of the victims of the St. Valentine's Massacre. Clark was Bug's brother-in-law. And legend says that Al Capone was convinced there were two people occupying that one bed cell he had. He could be heard at night by other inmates begging Jimmy to leave him alone. Other prisoners would hear him having conversations with someone. He later got a psychic to help him vanish Jimmy's spirit, but that didn't work. So up until his death, Al Capone believed he was being haunted by Jimmy. Wow. Yep. So I think well, that's what that's what people are hearing. Yeah. There is a huge haunting with Al Capone. There's like a there was this website that has like a full list of some of the things that happened to Al Capone, but mm -hmm. he also suffered from syphilis, which they believe that maybe he was just hallucinating. Oh. But I'm sure he was haunted just from I mean all the killings that he did. Oh yeah. And all the pain he caused and stuff. Oh, so, I'm pretty sure. I mean, he was tormented. Yeah. Do you want to read the Reddit story? I mean, that's it for my case. So I'll go ahead and read the Valentine's Reddit story. This is from Mr. Bean's Daughter Six. Some of these names sometimes I'm like, that's funny. Okay. Here I go. My friend had set me up with one of her work friends as I was single and really had nothing to do for Valentine's Day. She confirmed everything beforehand with the both of us, arranged a full-on date, she booked a restaurant reservation for us and everything, and I was quite thankful to her for thinking about me that much. That's a good friend. I mean... <laughs> I know, like, she did everything. Like, dang. I, but wait, when you said that, I thought to myself, like, don't tell me this is going to be something bad and I'm going to have to get mad at the friend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, keep we'll going. See. Anyway, fast forward to Valentine's Day. Me and my date were going to meet up at the restaurant for the first time. I had seen pictures of my date, so I knew what they looked like. We hadn't directly contacted or talked to each other before that because my friend wanted it to be a very blind date type of experience. That's why she made all the arrangements for us. But not that blind if she knew how he looked. Yeah. So she was like kind of blind, but don't speak to each other so y'all can meet first uh -huh. time. It was around 8 p.m. on Valentine's Day that we met up at the restaurant. My friend actually drove me there. Fast forward, I had a great time and by the end, my date decided to drop me off at my place as I didn't come in my own car. I agreed and off we went. My place at the time was a rental where I was sharing a house with four other housemates. It was relatively a big house so four people living didn't feel crowded at all. The house was down this dark road, the ones you see in horror movies that are surrounded by nothing but deep dark forest. Yeah, that was my house to my place. I like the fact that it's a long road full of trees and vacant. I think I just like to be alone so yeah. much that that's my ideal type of living to me i'd mm -hmm. be like oh i love this like drive. deep in the woods yeah it does sound very cozy yeah but i think at night it's probably scary probably but i mean mm -hmm. you're in a car run people over i know right? <laughs> that's, like, that's, that's true. the best weapon so at night the road used to get quite scary even for me anyways as my date was driving we talked about how nice the night went and we should meet up again for another date I was excited to hear that and agreed. As we were just chit-chatting while on this scary road, we saw this woman standing at the left side by the forest just waving her hands erratically at us as there were no other cars on that road. I don't know how to explain it, but the way she was waving her hand was really erratic as if she was in direct need of help. I told him to not stop the car as I was kind of creeped out, especially at such a dark road. It could have been a trap for all I know. My date at that point had slowed the car down a little bit. He thought that the woman was genuinely in need of help, but my intuition just didn't budge and I told him to not slow down and keep going. All of this happened in mere seconds of her coming in our vision and me having a bad feeling. My date wanted to help her, but at that point I was getting really scared so I told him a bit more loudly to not stop and keep going. As our car was side by side with this woman, I noticed her face even closely now and it is something I will never forget. Her face was half burned, but not recently burned. You know how burned skin looks after some time when it's been peeling off? I don't know how else to explain it, but she didn't look human. Her waving looked very human, but her face didn't. And as we were almost side by side with this woman, who mind you was still waving erratically, my date also noticed her face and that is when he stepped on the gas and zoomed from there. The scariest thing was how her face just didn't match her body's movement. Like from far, she looked like someone waving the car very panicky. But when we noticed her face, even when we were right next to her, her face looked expressionless and not 
panicky, but she still didn't stop waving even when we sped up. Oh so it's like God. her arms are moving erratically, but her face has no expression. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's so very creepy. I, I envisioned it right mm -hmm. now. I still remember looking back through the mirror and she was still waving to us until she vanished from our sight. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a bad feeling about something in your gut, you should listen to it. Mm -hmm. That night, my date dropped me off and very rightfully so was creeped out. I asked him to stay at my place if he wanted to, but he insisted that he would take a different route. We did end up going on another date. Unfortunately, it didn't work out, but that night still is ingrained in my memory of how she looked so expressionless and half of her face was burnt. I think it was something inhumane. And if we would have stopped to help her, who knows what would have happened. Oh, that is so, so scary. That is. I feel like that would be engraved. It's engraved right now. Like, yeah, I, I keep I kind of see it. Like, I know what she means. Yeah, I could see it, too. And that guy ballsy. I would have probably been like, yeah, I'm staying. I don't fucking care. Yeah. But I guess if there was another route, but still, that is... No, dude, I wouldn't even want to go outside and, like, yeah. get in my car. No, I'd be scared that she would follow. Mm -hmm. Like, she would be in the different route. Oh, I don't know. Imagine that, like, as a Valentine's date. That's something to remember. I mean, she's remembering that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a good story. Yeah, that's why I wanted to add it, because I'm like, this is a perfect Valentine's story. She had a good date, but got scared the crap out of mm -hmm. <laughs> all right well that was it for our episode so don't forget to email all your stories to something ominous pod at gmail.com and follow us on social media tiktok at something ominous instagram something ominous podcast and youtube something ominous see you next week bye bye